Hey, everybody on Zoom, Intern, and YouTube Live. Uh, we'll get started here in about 60 seconds. Just want to welcome you, everybody. Welcome everybody to the USA Hockey Webinar Series. Uh, looking forward to getting started. Dr. Cree, Lars, Heather, are you ready? Okay, just yep. want to welcome, welcome everybody to the USA Hockey webinar series presented by Pure Hockey and BioSteel. Uh, really excited to have uh, one of our first guests back, uh, Dr. Dean Cree, Lars, and our ADM manager for female hockey, Heather Mannix. She's also the, um, the master of fun, and we are excited to have both of them back for part two of the what is physical literacy, and Dr. Dean's going to really give us some good checklist of stuff that you can use within your practices and um, working with your athletes. So Heather, Dr. Krelars, it's, it's all yours. Um, and remember, if you are um, watching, if you have any questions, put it in the Q&A box on Zoom and on YouTube Live, we have the live chat going. So I'll be monitoring both. So um, the show is all yours. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. All right. Yeah. So we're really excited to have Dean back for, for part two. For those of you who didn't see part one, we talked about um, what physical literacy was and why it was important. And so I'm very happy to have you back. Dean, how you doing? I'm good. It's nice to be here with the uh, northern lights behind me up here in Canada. Love the background. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. So for those so, of you who are new with us, sorry, Dean, I just want to make sure you're properly introduced. Um, <laughs> if you're tuning in for the first time, part one was, I believe, on April 3rd, so make sure you check that out on the USA Aki uh, YouTube page. But for those of you who are new with us, Dean's one of the leading researchers in physical literacy. Um, he's helped to spearhead the application of this concept across all sorts of different sports and physical activity realms. Um, he's worked with organizations from the local level to national, international, I think a few Scandinavian governments as well in there. Um, and yeah, so again, part one was more of what, what physical literacy was, why it was important. So we're really excited to see what you have for us and how coaches can take that and start to actually apply it to their practices. So I know you have a lot to cover, so I'm just going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to pull up my screen share here and let you guys see my little PowerPoint. Um, So what you get to see here is uh, uh, when I go into presentation mode, hopefully, I'll say here I go. Um, you should be able to see just my single screen slide now. Can you there, Heather? Yep. Is that good? Just one screen? Yep. So what I've got prepared for you today is um, what we're going to call quality sport through quality practices. And what I've done is taken a large number of individual points or vignettes and that it will be in a series of slides. And my goal is for the audience to understand each individual point. Any coach in the audience can take one, two, five of the points and try to implement that into their practice sessions. And uh, I don't expect everybody to get every single one of the points, not that they're complicated, but it's a lot to take in. But I'm doing it so that independent of the level that you're uh, coaching at or independent of your expertise in coaching, you'll always find something in this presentation. Um, this is physical literacy enriched coaching, but that word isn't commonplace in, in society yet, nor in sport. It's growing very rapidly. So I'm going to avoid a lot of physical literacy terminology today uh, specifically and talk more about the very important elements of practices or drills that are essential to develop players. So if I, if I quiz hockey players, hockey coaches from around the world, and they answer me, what are the most important physical characteristics of players? This is what I get. Um, you may not use the same terms, but most uh, coaches will agree that they want really good technical skills in their players, uh, stick handling skills, skating skills. And that's really what we drive most of our coaching education towards is technical development. 
And then often in, in sports and certainly in hockey, those items from two, three, four, five are, you know, strength and conditioning fitness elements. And so for most hockey today, we, we do a really good job or a pretty good job at developing technical skills. And we then also have this land-based focus that is on developing the physical aspects of the player. At the bottom, um, you'll see like the concept of spatial awareness. And that's interesting, even though many coaches say people need spatial awareness, the funny thing about that is that they don't necessarily put that into their practice by design. They hope that the people develop spatial awareness, the ability to avoid collisions, et cetera. And so things like spatial awareness is something that you can put into a practice quite easily if you, if you plan for it. Diverse mu movement repertoire is something where people really develop a, a set of movement skills that equip them for on ice performance, not just for scoring goals, but for defending as well as avoiding collisions, et cetera. And how you get that through practices is an interesting thing as well. And we'll talk about that. The last one on the list is, is an interesting one because I hear from a lot of coaches that they want the ability to cut right, cut left, skate right, skate left, um, uh, or even use the stick in both right and left hands in a symmetrical way. And there is some huge value to that. And in the last 15 years, there's been pretty big advances in, in motor abilities, especially in stick handling. And we'll talk about that as we go through. But oddly enough, when I go to coaching sessions and I work with coaches directly, the next series of questions I ask them is not about the physical capacity. I ask them what is the most important psychological components of their athletes. And this is what they answer. In hockey, we see that most coaches are really interested in self or intrinsically motivated people. And part of what I'm gonna talk about today is as a coach creating a motivational climate that is conducive to keeping athletes in your sport. And it's not about saying, go, 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 Billy or Betty. It's really about what are the factors that really are critical in making people intrinsically motivated. I'm doing this because I want to, as opposed to being told to. The second one that we see is confidence. And that is a critical part of, of development in athletes and developing competent and confident movers is what physical literacy is all about. So we will talk uh, a bit on that. Focused and determined. Um, the ability to focus, it's one of the most common things we yell out at athletes, focus in practices. And yet, you know, we shouldn't be yelling that. We should be creating circumstances in our drills and practices where they can focus and more importantly, turn off things that might be distracting so they can really uh, focus on the tasks they need to do. Another one that's uh, highly rated is the ability to create an independent decision maker so that when they're on the ice, they're gonna be a playmaker. And how do you do that? Often in our practices, we tell children or developing hockey players what to do as opposed to giving the option to problem solve for themselves. And that's really critical to do that, to make an independent playmaker. Um, ability to imagine emotions and anxiety is critical. Um, uh, not flying off the deep end is, is important and that's a practiced skill. It's not something you just hope for. Being a goal setter and a person who can execute their own training programs at home, punctuality, critical for most coaches. Aware of other people and what they, uh, and the environment that you're in. Commitment and the last one, control over the outcome, which means that they're autonomous. That means that they're not independent, Autonomy means that they're the agent of their own uh, uh, development. That means that I'm in control. I'm the person that's responsible for doing things. And when you get people like that, they tend to be the ones who are gonna really commit. So we're gonna talk about um, designing practices and coaches that develop both the psychological and physical and, and a couple others as well. So this is a model that will be published uh, this year. This is what's called a holistic development model. And this model is highly complementary to the ADM of, of uh, uh, USA Hockey and all sports actually and was designed to be that way. And this model that I'm gonna talk you through, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on it, is a model that talks about, we need sport participation excellence, meaning not people dropping out of sport, and we need sport performance excellence. That's the goal of USA Hockey, both of those. And that's certainly something that I strive for too in all sports. I don't want people dropping out for the wrong reasons. I do want them to drop out for the right reasons. I don't like this sport. I'm gonna do another, that's an okay thing. 
sport participation excellence also means that we don't filter away people who haven't developed appropriately. But if you look at this diagram, what's really important for you to see is it talks about that people can exit from participation at any level. They can exit from entry level all the way up to the excellence level. And, uh, and they can exit for good reasons and they can exit for bad reasons as well. And what we wanna do in our sport, in hockey, is actually stop people from exiting for the wrong reasons, which sadly are mostly in coaching control. The other thing that I'll make you aware of is that many people exit entering. They don't enter the sport of hockey because we don't do a really, really good job at promoting the fact that it has really good characteristics. So we're losing people even before they begin. So this model is based on entry to excellence and it's a competency progression model. And what's critical is that the competency progression model is fanned out into four categories. The development of physical technical abilities of the athletes, which is what we overly focus on. It also talks about the development of the psychological competencies of the player the social competencies of the player, which we almost completely ignore formally in, in almost any sport. And the last one, which is really critical, especially in this day and age, almost all of you have seen the stick handling ability of the very high level players in the NHL, now almost like lacrosse players on ice in some cases. And why I'm saying that to you is that that is a creative ability that we value in coaching, and yet we don't develop that in our coaching sessions. So if you look at my coloration there, Almost all of our coaching sessions focus on the technical, the one in black. A little bit less on physical, like strength and conditioning and fitness, a bit on tactical, but very little on psychological, social, and creative development of the athletes. And hopefully through this uh, uh, webinar today, we'll start to peek into these. This will not be everything, but we it's the first stab at going into it. So I'm gonna start off with the problem that we have in sport. I call it the one third problem. And we know very well in developing hockey players that are in children and youth categories, because they're certainly developing hockey players at 40. But I would argue that for children and youth, we know that there are early developers, normal developers, and late developers. And our system in Canada, United States is really focused at the early bloomers, the people who are uh, in early stages. And I've got this reversed color coded here. I'm sorry for that. But for the early people, the people who really develop quickly at a young age, our processes, our coaching sessions are often catered to them. And that means they get selected to develop. And that's cool. I have nothing wrong with that. But what happens then is that people who are late developers are often the people who are discarded and our coaching sessions often don't cater to them. So I like to say in fun and jest, if you read my little statement on the right hand side there, the best hockey player has never been seen. Because if we throw away one third of the people and they leave participation in the sport and we don't give them the opportunity to develop technical, tactical, social, psychological skills because they're not good enough yet, we throw away the potential best player. And what's interesting is that people say to me, they'll react and say, hey, Dean, look at that 15 year old on the, on the field of, on, on the rink. That's a great player. And I go, yeah, they're a great player and they're probably early selected and they developed along our pathway that didn't filter them out. That's good. But I'm gonna argue that that player might've been the worst player if we have kept the other 33%. And so think about that as coaches when you're trying to deliver your coaching sessions about early and late developers. There is very good science that shows that the late developers, if they stay in sport, can be some of the best that we have. So the game of developing good coaching is about creating a, a coaching session, a practice, a drills that allow children to thrive and not just those who survive your drills. We're very good at, you can make it through this, you can go to the next level. Thriving is what we're about. I'm very happy to say that USA Hockey has a really good attitude towards de developing the whole person, developing the athlete, and then developing the player and in that sequence. And I think that's a lofty goal and I get that, but it is important because we know that players that get that become good athletes are typically the best international players we have. So they're more diverse than just looking at hockey. 
So this will be my one slide on physical literacy. I will not go into it in detail today because you can go back and watch my previous webinar if you wish. This is what we call the physical literacy engine. And it really talks about developing movement competencies in children and youth and older adults for that matter uh, on, on ice and in different circumstances and simultaneously that you develop their confidence. And most coaches, when I say, hey, what's your practice plan for developing confidence? They look at me with deer eyes and headlights and go, well, I don't know. They are very good at eroding confidence, but how do you actually develop it? And we'll talk about that later. But in physical literacy, it demands that we don't just develop competence or technical skills, that we develop confidence at the same time. Because we know that if you develop competence and confidence, you create people that are self-competent. And if they are, they're motivated to participate and they don't drop out and wave bye-bye to the sport. The other aspect about physical literacy is that when we're practicing, when we're competing, when we're in the locker room before and after the game, it is really important for coaches to not ignore the social aspect of the sport and create opportunities to create connections, not just friendships, but just types of connections between rinks, places, people, things, groups. I'm a hockey player. That's a connection. Because we know that if you create connections, you create what's called relatedness in psychological theory. And relatedness drives motivation, which drives participation and keeps kids in sport. The last one, which Heather is a master at, the master of fun, and her former supervisor, Amanda Visick, on a recent seminar, talked about fun, enjoyment, and happiness. And it is really critical to have in physical literacy an enjoyable experience so that people are continue to be motivated to participate. I'll talk about autonomy a little later on. This is an important diagram to learn because it's my diagram that I use to, as, a, as a practitioner to change the way in which I make my practices. This diagram is my pedagogy. It tells me what to do. So luckily enough, USA Hockey has taken the word of physical literacy, and it's created this document, Five Essentials of Quality Practice Design, which I completely subscribe to. And you'll notice from that previous diagram in physical literacy, it includes a, a key factor as fun and enjoyment. Because fun is in the moment, hey, this is good, this is great. Might have a smile on, might not, but it's fun. Enjoyment says, hey, that was a good practice, or that was a good drill, thinking back about it. And then two, they say a very important thing, lots of touches of the puck, and that's repetition-based learning. We're gonna talk lots about that. Number three is decision-making. We can't be telling kids what to do all the time. We need to create problem-solving, decision-making opportunities and practices. Yesterday, Stu Armstrong gave a great session on looks like the game, and he talked about the context of, of learning skills. And he talks about that. It's more important to take a context and then have the skill developed in that context than to put the skill into context. And I 100% agree that is very uh, in good alignment with physical literacy. We'll talk more about the details of that later. Finally, levels of challenge. Very critical that every participant in hockey should have a level of challenge that's suited to them. So let's drill down on some of these. So the first one I'm gonna do is a very simple one. And this is called movement terminology. And oddly enough, uh, when I'm working in physical education settings and I come into a classroom of grade, you know, six kids and I, and I say, show me what, show me jumping, they'll hop. And, or I say, show me what a leap is, they'll jump. Show me what a hop is, they'll jump. Show me what a jump is, they'll hop. They actually don't know the words of movement. And in hockey, we've got a lot of terminology that we use and we say to kids, and kids are very good mimics. They can copy us well. So as a coach, it is really important that the cognition of the athlete is engaged in a way that they know when you say something, it means this. And if you show them it and they copy you, you actually don't know if they know the words of movement. So as a hockey coach, it's really important to make sure they know the words of movement by actually checking. So what I do with kids, I put my hands on my hips and I say, show me what a jump is. And if 50% of the kids hop, which is one foot, I go, okay, here's what jumping is. And I show two feet and then everybody gets it. So I confirm that everybody knows what these terms mean. And in hockey, we rarely do that. And why is that important? People need to know the terminology because if they don't know the words, two things can happen. 
they do the wrong thing in that moment, which is dangerous or performance degrading, or two, they get inhibited. They, they don't want to perform because I don't know what you're telling me to do. So one of the most simple things, and this isn't the most complex, is that actually check that the players know what the words mean. Let's go to the next one, which is probably one of the most important, which is based on the five essential USA hockey rules is repetition-based learning. I'm a neuroscientist by my background, so I study the brain and how it learns movement. And we know very clearly that you learn things by having repetitions. So if you have kids standing in line and one kid is actually doing the movement and every three minutes, one kid gets another try, that is a very low repetition count, which means that it would take a very long time for all kids to develop the competency that you want. But it's not just about getting touches on the puck, that's important. It's also knowledge of results. And this is interesting because as coaches, we should learn to zip our mouths a little bit more and not talk so much during our coaching sessions and make our drills so that the drills show the kid what to do. And that would be very appropriate with Stu's talk yesterday about contextual learning, that they can see whether they're doing it right or wrong inside the drill. They don't have to get feedback from the coach. Feedback from the coach is important, don't get me wrong, but it's important to create drills, not in all cases, where the child can actually see that they're doing it right or wrong. They have a clear understanding of the objectives of the drill and they can see, hey, I'm doing it right or wrong. And maybe a little later, I'll give you a, a very clear example of that. So it is known in science that if you give a child 20, 30, 40 repetitions, trials, that what happens is when they start to drill and they maybe do, do it three or four times, it looks sloppy. They have errors, they have mistakes. And that if they get more and more repetitions, the number of mistakes that they make drops way down. And that's what you want. You need to have every child get enough repetitions so that their sloppiness, their mistakes, their motor control errors reduces down. Because everybody makes mistakes. The game is about reducing the number of mistakes over time, not eliminating mistakes, that's impossible. But if you give enough repetitions with knowledge of results, good feedback during the drill or after the drill, you can actually uh, uh, get a lot better learning outcomes of the person. And I'll say one little thing here. It is really critical that athletes learn how to self-monitor. Most of our athletes don't know if they're doing good in their sport unless they're told by a parent or a coach. It is vital as a coach that you allow children to actually figure out for themselves, where am I along the progression? Where am I? Like if you run a, uh, a read, repeat, sprint, skate test, which is a cardiovascular fitness test on ice, kids don't know how fit they are until they've done that test and you tell them a number, but inter or run a beep test or a yo-yo test. But it should be true that every child knows their level of fitness or knows their competency levels, and you can design that into your drills. So one of the biggest things is if you look at drills and some long-standing drills in hockey that violate the repetition-based learning rules, the most famous one would be the horseshoe drill. And if you look at the horseshoe drill, you're going to see a long lineup of kids, half of them actually passing a puck, one, and then half skating and coming in onto the goalie and getting a pass to them. If you count the number of skating reps that they have, how many stick control moments they have and how much time on task they get in that drill, it's minuscule. It is easy to actually take drills like the horseshoe drill and modify it using these principles of almost no lineups so that every kid is moving. And that's a really important part because if every kid is moving in circuits as opposed to very large lineups, you actually get the desired outcome, which is increased movement competency and also confidence. So as a coach, what's important is that we often set up our lesson plan for 60 minutes or whatever your time session is. And you go, hey, I'm going to have 10 minutes. You've got 10 minutes to do this, kids. And interestingly enough, unless you know your kids really well, 10 minutes may not be the right amount of time. First off, it might be too much. Second off, it might be too little. If it's too much, they get bored. If it's too little, they don't learn. And then you say, okay, next drill. We've, we've learned that now. Let's do the next thing. And then you try to add in complexity. And that's a problem 
it's important to understand that you should be a little bit more flexible as a coach in not maybe using time-based drills, but actually look as they're developing in the, in, in the drill that you're doing and say, hey, 80% of my kids have this skill now. Let's move on. It might be 90%, but if it's 50-50, you better not be moving on because if you move on, those 50 kids are saying, see you later. Immediately, you're telling those kids you're not valued because if you do the next skill, which has added complexity, they're going to they're gonna walk on you mentally. And that's really important. So try to loosen up your thinking related to time base and say accomplishment-based. So the, comp, the opposite of time-based drills is accomplishment-based drills. And remember, and I've said this already, feedback doesn't just come from, from the coach. It comes from the drill itself. And you can change drills and we can give examples maybe in future webinars where we can actually change drills where the child or the participant knows whether they're achieving the goals or objectives. Hey, Dean, real quick. Yeah. On that last yeah. slide. Um, feedback mm -hmm. coming from the coach, how do you suggest that be given to the kids? Yeah, it's uh, really good. I mean, there's a lot of science on providing feedback and uh, feedback can occur live time, of course. And interestingly enough, and I'll have a slide on this later, one of the worst things you can do as a coach is try to provide instruction while they're moving. You actually want to abandon that practice, guaranteed. And there is an exception, and I'll talk to you about that. But I, I will say that it is critical to provide the feedback at the end of the repetition. And certainly if you have iPhones and things like that, you can set up with a delay and a kid can come around and say a 10 second delay and watch themselves and self-reflect on their, their tactical ability. That's really good feedback. Um, don't provide it while they're moving. There is an exception and I'll talk about that later. And if you are gonna provide feedback, provide not just a criticism, but provide a modification that they can have for the next execution, a cue, a single cue perhaps. And that's really important so that we do what's called a sandwich feedback, positive, negative, positive, or negative, positive, something like that. Great question. So one of the things that we don't realize when we're working with players, and I, I, I work with coaches extensively on fixing this issue, which is called time pressure. And when we're running activities um, and you create a lineup, and especially if you have a lineup of kids, which you should almost never have, or at least have small lineups only. What happens then is that if a child feels that somebody's behind them and they need to move out of the way, that actually is one of the greatest factors in stopping a person from focusing on learning the skill if they're worried about what's happening behind them. So they can't feel rushed. And you can't just say to the kid, don't feel rushed. You have to, they, if, if they perceive that it's there, if it's real or not, it doesn't matter you're gonna minimize skill acquisition if you feel that they're rushed. So we create smaller lineups and smaller lineups with fewer kids creates less time pressure. And so you can read some of the stuff on the bottom there. You're gonna be able to look at this on YouTube later on. So I'm not gonna go through all the text on this, but, but if they feel they wanna vacate and exit, that's a very important thing. Time pressure is not your friend for learning movement skills. Interestingly though, if you're a high performance hockey coach, you should start with no time pressure, and then develop time pressure in your coaching sessions. That's something you should strategize because in real hockey, there's time pressure. So you can't just have your drills with no time pressure. They have to progress. The other one is peer pressure. And this is a very powerful one. If you have kids on display failing in front of other kids, that should be something you have to be very cognizant of. The horseshoe drill also fails on this. You're gonna see every other child is watching every other child fail. And if you do that at, at a very high level of performance, it is certainly acceptable to expect failure in front of audience and peers. At entry level developmental hockey, learning how to fail is a really important thing. And what you need to do is drop the peer pressure. Doesn't mean you don't bring it back, but initially when people are learning skills, you need to minimize peer pressure. So what I do, I'll give you an example. I'll create lineups for three or four kids doing all the same task instead of 15 kids lined up to do one task. That will reduce the peer pressure because if you have three kids on each set of pylons on the ice, all three kids are moving at once. So nobody's watching each other fail. 
and they're getting in hundreds of repetitions. And if they know what they need to do, they're not being called back because they lose the puck deking around the pylon and saying, you're at fault, get to the back of the line. Those peer pressure circumstances create what's called social inhibition. And social inhibition is a dagger in the back of a person, a psychological dagger that you can't see. 30% of children and up to 60% of female hockey players have been seriously socially inhibited by their coaches. And what's relevant there is that that social inhibition manifests in a whole bunch of ways and not wanting to participate, not wanting to volunteer to be a leader, a whole bunch of ways. And worst case, it creates a person who exits the sport. So be very careful about this. It doesn't mean that you can't bring back peer pressure, but in the initial stages, it's really critical. So what we do is we create lots of shorter lines so that everybody's moving at once. That creates an anonymous situation where people can fail safely and also succeed as well. This is where in hockey, it's often a good idea to create circuits on the ice. And, and so you have station A, station B, station C, and then you rotate the kids through circuits. And that can be very useful to minimize observers, which then creates social inhibition. Talk about the audience effect a little later on. So social inhibition is actually a subconscious avoidance of social interaction. It can manifest on in practice sessions, in the locker room, off ice. Kid walking away quickly, I'm out of here. You see that happening, you probably have created a circumstance where the kid has been socially inhibited. And in the early stages of development, it is critical not to create socially inhibited participants. And you can't just say to the kid, buck up, stand up and do it in front of a bunch of kids. It's okay to fail. That is not how it works. You have to stop them from failing in front of a large group in the initial stages. And then later on, they'll feel more comfortable with failing and succeeding. And if you do this, what's really important is they'll, they'll see, they'll learn that success comes from failure, not the opposite around. Don't avoid failure. So this is critical. So everyone moving and failing is okay but failing in front of a large group is a problem. Here's what um, uh, Heather referred to, cueing during a movement. And when we're providing learning circumstances and drills, it is really critical not to provide information that changes the way in which they do something while they're moving. There is an exception. If you are learning a task for the first time, like doing sort of a, a figure eight, uh, stick handling drill, and that's your first time you're doing it and you're a novice at it. If you shout to the participant cues to do that while they're moving, it actually stops their higher brain center and they're going to focus on you and lose control of the puck, which is not good. So what's critical is that you let them have enough repetitions where the number of errors goes from here and drops down naturally, and you give that adequate time to happen. And if you're providing instruction while they're learning, they're actually distracting them. Um, so it is important that you can provide temporal cueing, that if you have something that requires a rhythm, you can do clapping, for instance, while kids move or produce a musical sound or what have you. That's not instruction. At the end of a session that they're moving, providing instruction and cueing, so they go back and do it again with not just one rep, but multiple reps is really the right way to do it. There is an exception, and that's on the last line, that if you've got a skill like, we'll call it a figure eight stick handling drill, and the child has had enough repetitions, and all of a sudden they can do it quite well 30 or 40 times in a row, and don't lose control of the ball or the puck. That would mean that the child has got that automatically. They've got the skill automatic. It's built into a program in your motor control centers and they've got it. That means that that skill is now automatic. That is when you can talk to them. At that point, you can add verbal cues. That kid can stick handle this way. Now I can add a verbal cue while they're moving to add something onto that, but not until they have it can you do that. So that's when we layer on what we call movement complexity. The audience effect is also a big one that we, we really mess up on as coaches. Um, I've worked with uh, Olympic athletes uh, most of my life, and I've worked with ones that have had severe anxiety performing in front of a group. 
they're really good in training sessions, but in competitions. And it's interesting when there's a big, you know, the sixth player uh, effect, they fail. And it's really important that coaches realize that if I'm performing in front of my friends, that's an audience. If I'm performing in front of my parents, that's an audience. If I'm performing in front of my girlfriend, that's a different audience. If I'm performing in front of a national team coach who walks in, that's a different audience. You can't just take it for granted. You can't just hope that kids get better dealing with audiences. You have to have them practice that. That means going from small groups to larger groups to larger groups and that they feel comfortable moving in front of others. You can't take it for granted. Another theory that, and again, these are all just little vignettes that you can, you can take every one of these slides and go to your practice sessions and see if you're accomplishing it. This is a checklist. A very important rule in physical literacy is a level of challenge for all levels of ability. And I touched on this in my last workshop. In practices, it's important that all children in a practice have a level of challenge matched to their level of ability. I know that sounds grandiose, it is possible to do. Mostly coaches teach to one level, the best or the middle or the worst, and most not to the worst. But there are ways to set up practices, especially with circuit training type thinking, where you can have different levels of challenge and then partition the kids so they can all develop. Why is that critical? Because if it's too easy, you're out. <clears throat> if it's too hard, you're out. If, you're, if it's just right, you're in. And in means you're engaged. And in the fun research, it tells us kids are very clear that having fun is mastering something. Having fun is learning something new. So that if you've got a practice session where you can train people, where you can give levels of challenge to everybody, everybody's in. So circuit training is one of the best ways to do that, where you partition the ice into different components and then everybody can have a level of challenge and then you rotate through that. It does take practice and it's not easy to do. But if you're only teaching to one third of your one third of your group, you're basically turning off everybody and reducing possibilities. The other aspect to this that's really important in the physical literacy world is what we call plus oneing. And once a child is engaged in the competency progression and the skill development progression, it's really important to have in your pocket as a coach. These five kids need a plus one. So hey, okay, you guys have been practicing this. Let's layer on complexity for you five. You guys keep doing this till you get it. And, oh, you guys got this. Let's add another plus one. And what's really important as, as coaches is that if a child engages into learning something and all of a sudden they get a good stick handling skill, you have to plus one them. And as soon as they master it, plus one them. Master it, plus one them. And the game of learning how to plus one something means that as a coach, you have in your pocket these plus one progressions. And this is a way of keeping kids engaged. And in the last five years, there's really good science that tells us this plus oneing effect is a really important thing to keep kids motivated and keeps kids progressing in the direction that we want them. If you don't have a plus one in your pocket, they get bored. And if you plus two them, they, it's too complex. So plus oneing is the idea. I already talked about layering complexity, but this is a good term to, to understand. Layering complexity is a critical thing that a coach needs to have. You do a drill for X number of repetitions and 90% of the kids um, get the basic rudimentary skill. So they've entry level competence or mastered the basic skill. When they've all done that, that's when you layer complexity. They get the rudimentary skill, then you layer in the next thing. If you layer it in too quickly, they go backwards and they turn right off. There's a whole bunch of downstream negatives. And this is where I went back to timing. You cannot use time unless you're, you really know your kids as the means by which to say, did I get enough repetitions? You have to be a coach and saying, hey, yeah, my 23 kids on ice today, 22 of them got the skill. So now I'm gonna layer on. I'm gonna layer on the next level. And there's lots of examples of this. And in a, maybe another session, we can be very specific or maybe Heather asked me that. Hey, Here's uh, another Dean, one. Dean, I just wanna, yeah. um, when you're saying skill, I know uh, Stuart yesterday was talking about skill is not technique. So um, yeah. 
You know, I think yeah. that's the thing that as our coaches need to understand that skill is not, hey, I can go around this front fake better and that's the technique or whatever it is. If you're a goalie, that glove save is better. It's the skill, the context yeah. within. Right. And you're dead on right. Is that, and we're going to talk about that in a second and we're going to go back to Stu's commentary because he he's right. Physical literacy demands that the context is the critical determinant of skill development. If you if you you dissociate that, and I'll give you an example. Um, if if I have a uh, if I pass a puck in a horseshoe drill to a kid and he goes in on the goalie and shoots on the goalie, in ninety nine percent of cases, that's not the real life circumstance. There is pressure normally to that child. There is a defender, and that's training for a breakaway, which is also important to train for but it's not real, it's not contextually appropriate. So layering on complexity, if you're really good at it, means you're layering on contextual complexity that is appropriate to the sport. And we'll talk more about that, but great point, uh, Dave, really good comment. Learning at speed will bring us to that point. So learning at speed means that most people learn skills at slow speed, and that's good. And then often a coach will look and say, hey, they've got the skill at low speed and they move on. Uh, 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 uh. If they can learn how to stick handle at low speed, you need to progress the speed and you need to bring it up to what we call performance speed over time. And if you don't give them adequate time, you cannot believe that stick handling in a certain way at a slow speed is equivalent to stick handling in a contextually high speed circumstance, never mind having pressure. So it's critical that as a coach, you don't just say, hey, they got their, 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 this sort of stick handling uh, ability you need to say, do they have the stick handling ability at speed? So we always say in the industry, accuracy first, speed second. So some coaches will actually go to speed and then try to develop the movement skill when they should be actually saying, let's go slower, get accuracy first. So very few repetition errors. And then you progress along the speed continuum. So accuracy first, speed second. So here's some other examples that you're talking about, Dave, of progression parameters. If a kid's driving to the net on an open goalie, that's an interesting thing. But you have to think for your drills and your coaching sessions, how do I progress things? And certainly speed is a progression. Direction is a progression. Pressure is a really important progression. Almost all errors of puck control don't happen from contact with another player they happen when they're under pressure with a player. This is really interesting because teaching kids like in a gauntlet drill to do shoulder little checking and hold a puck is an interesting thing, but has almost no contextual reality to the sport. The sport means that, well, I've got a puck and there's a player coming at me, that's pressure. I perceive the pressure of that person. They may not even have to contact me and it will influence my ability to handle the puck. So you can do this as a coach and say, hey, I've got a, a child driving to the net and I can put a stationary player. Then I can put a player that can move a certain amount. Then I can put a player who can move right and left. I can progress the pressure. And in, in, in addition to that, you have to teach people how to deal with contact and contact avoidance or collision avoidance. And how, do you, how many reps did you give your children to learn how to avoid contact? You can't just hope for that. You have to actually practice collision avoidance. So we've got a lot of different uh, approaches. And the other one that we have to progress and think about is what's called competition progression. And well, I have a slide on that. Confidence is a really big one. And as I said, most coaches, when, they, when I say, what are you doing to develop competent and confident movers? They look at me with deer and headlights and understandably, I get it. So we like to say the little thing in yellow is the phrase we say, confidence is built on a road with fun and challenges where successes exceed failures. That means failures are happening, but the number of successes the child is getting is beginning to tip against their failures. And when they are failing, they're feeling secure that failure is okay. They're not trying to avoid failures. If it's not fun and it's not at the right challenge level, which is optimal challenge theory, confidence is not built. So you can almost check yourself. Do your children feel that it's safe to fail? Yes or no. Is the challenge appropriate to all levels of ability? Yes or no. 
Is it fun and enjoyable? Yes or no? And is your drill providing enough repetitions where the successes are overcoming their failures? So the errors are decreasing over time. That's how you create confidence. You can't just give them a sticker. You can't just say, hey, be confident. That doesn't work. You have to create a contextually appropriate drill where they develop their confidence, not you tell them that. They have to see that they're getting better overall. Their perceived competence is in, improving and they certainly shouldn't be avoiding failure. And in hockey, we're particularly good at making kids be afraid of failure. And we need to fix that because failure is how you get better at, at the early stages. Rivalry and competition. I'm a big fan of competition, but I'm a big uh, advocate for not taking adult competition thinking and applying it to kids. So even if kids are playing pickup hockey and not keeping score, they still are, have rivalry, meaning everybody knows who's in control of the puck. So rivalry happens in training sessions and competition, they're similar words. And why I'm saying this to you as coaches is that if you have a training session and you put one kid against another kid and say a pylon race, and they're learning the skill for the first time, you are doing everything in your power to tell the kids not to learn. If the very first thing you do is set up a competition to do some agility skating drills, that is the, a surefire way to not have kids develop competence. So initially you would have them do drills uh, where they're not even in a parent or perceived competition, where they're doing agility drills, where they can't even compare themselves with others. And then slowly you layer in competition. So yeah, then it's head to head. That's cool. And then you know what's even cooler yet? Put the two skating. So I could set up a situation where they're doing a pylon race, but they're doing pylons where they're separated by five meters, sorry, 20 feet. And then, sorry, USA, Canada thing there. But then all of a sudden I put the pylons closer and all the pylons, now there's a possibility of a collision. Interesting, right? So then I'm actually having real agility, an authentic progression where they're doing an agility race with the ability to collide, which is important. I'm planning for that. Some of you may have seen this. Dave, have you seen this yet? Have you, did you watch this documentary on, the, on this basketball team? No, not yet. Not yet. But, uh, all our colleagues have watched it. I don't really watch a lot of TV. I just do webinars. That's all I do. Uh, no, I know your life is a webinar life. <laughs> Well, this is an in interesting one because there's this, there's this basketball player who is pretty good on this team. He might be pictured in, the, in this, uh, 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 their, their little uh, documentary here. And it's interesting because coaches are very good and parents and some athletes of saying, hey, if I've got an elite NHL hockey player or an elite uh, basketball player on the Raptors, what's their training program? What's their strategies? What's their approaches? Well, we should be doing that at the developmental level. And that is one of the worst things on, you know, on the earth to do um, for a whole bunch of reasons. That's why USA Hockey is shifting to small-sided hockey. If you're a five-year-old, a, a full-size rink is basically the size of a football field. So to me, taking high-performance circumstances and coaching strategies in that and applying it to developmental hockey is very dangerous. So I'm gonna use this as an example. In this Last Dance 10 part documentary series on this very good team, one of the things that uh, Jordan says is he stepped up. So he didn't, want, he didn't want anybody to be allowed to make mistakes, not allowing mistakes. And that's cool. At the high performance level, minimizing mistakes is really, really critical. And if you had a really good developmental life, at the early levels, what we need to do is allow mistakes to happen, failures, and you give enough repetitions that those mistakes can be reduced in a contextually appropriate way, a contextually appropriate drill like Stu would say. And then by the time you get at the high performance level, you've minimized the likelihood of, of those mistakes from happening. But if you take a, don't allow mistakes at an eight-year-old, 10-year-old, 12-year-old level, well, that's exactly how they learn. 
in the game, those mistakes are critical learning moments for children. And if you voice to them to avoid mistakes, they don't see them as learning opportunities. They see them as something to be avoided and they go into a posturing, which is very evident in, in kids. So the story on this slide is very simply, don't take adult expert models and apply them to developmental circumstances, whether that's the size of the field, the competition structure, you name it. Be very careful about doing that. I still see 14-year-old male hockey players with NHL strength and conditioning plans in their hands. That is inappropriate, very inappropriate, shameful, actually. So here's some new neuroscience for you, for the group. And this is uh, from my science part of the talk. So one of the things we do in, in neuroscience is we try to control motor control errors. And there's two types of motor control errors that can happen. One is where the brain, your brain fails to, to control your muscles right. We call that a brain failure, if you like. And that means you need to train the brain how better to control the body. The other type of error, motor control error two, is where if my muscles don't have enough force, torque generating ability, and even if my brain says to my muscle, do this, the muscles can't do it. Both result in a failure. Now, really interestingly, if you think about what we do in hockey, everything we do, strength, conditioning, physical preparation is focused on motor control error too, is it not? Everything's focused on eliminating muscles need to be bigger, blah, blah. That's cool, nothing wrong with that. But almost in every circumstance where we see injuries or where we see failure to perform, it's a brain failure. And that goes back to everything that I just said, providing repetitions that are contextually appropriate for children to develop their movement competencies that are specific to the game. That's motor controller error one. It is vital that we do that. And there's a whole bunch of examples of how to do that. But I'm gonna tell you, when I look at most coaching practices, and I do an evaluation based on all of this, I see a lot of absence of check marks. Here's one that's really interesting called a selection error. And this is a big one for concussion uh, prevention. Most of you, Dave, you played hockey, Heather, you played hockey, you play still hockey. You know, what's interesting is that if I asked you, which way could you get out of the corner better? So you're in a corner and you're gonna get out one way or another. I almost guarantee Heather and Dave will think about that for a second and go, yeah, 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 I was always better going this way or that way. And interestingly enough, if you don't have athletes get out of the corner both ways pretty good, and yeah, that looked like a dance. I know that that was like a, the Backstreet Boys. Uh, but if you don't have the ability to get out of a corner equally on both sides, you're going to develop a preference. And what happens then is that if you see the example at the bottom, if I need to cut left, but I'm only good at cutting right, but I need to cut left in this circumstance, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna cut right, and then I'm gonna get in a collision, maybe get a concussion. This is what's called a selection error. And that selection error can create injury or lack of performance. So in your drills, especially nowadays, it becomes really important that you create not perfect symmetry, that's not possible, but to not allow huge asymmetries to occur in cutting or stick handling ability. It doesn't mean you need to be able to switch your stick and be a switch hitter. That's not what I'm asking for. I'm asking for that you think about this because if you don't, if you create a big selection preference for an athlete, that's all they got. And then they also become predictable by coaching and they can be defended. So try to create as much symmetry as you can in your drills. This is a, a, another one that's related to that. Um, in the third period, and you've got a good end-to-end -end game of hockey going on, you're a sweaty little mess, right? You're, a, you're under armor, sorry, whatever shirt you're wearing underneath your jersey is sweaty by the third period. And by that third period, you're fatiguing. And we know clearly that the more fatigue a person has, the more errors or mistakes that happen mentally and physically. What's relevant here as a coach is that as, as a coach myself, I will actually make people get fatigued and then I'll make them do a stick handling drill at 50% speed because I want them to have their brain 
to learn how to stick handle when they're fatigued. We never do that. We do all our stick handling drills at the very beginning when you're fresh and that's good. Definitely do that. But as people progress, they need to learn how to move in the face of fatigue. And that's a brain training that you can do. You can actually learn, I'm fatigued. Okay, I gotta run this way, or I gotta skate this way, or I stick handle this way, this is the way I do it. But if you don't have practice doing that, you'll never learn. And then you get really sloppy. So giving kids an ability to learn how to, it, but, but critical, don't fatigue them with a big skate and all of a sudden ask them to do it at 100% performance. Skate them hard and then have them go at 50%. And then go to 60, 70, 80. But you know what? You're asking them to do it in the game. If you got to, even, let's just say you're a short shifted team, you're only doing three shifts, not four, and you're hopping over the boards, and you know, some players injured or some players in the box, you're on the ice a lot. And those errors need to be controlled. And that can make the difference between getting injured, getting aggressive, overly aggressive, or even losing your performance. Interesting, right? Two slides left. Um, one coach, one sport problem. You know, I, as a physical literacy guy, it's really important to say most kids play multiple sports and that's a good thing. And USA Hockey is endorsing that. The more diverse movement experiences children have at a younger age, prior to the age of 15, the more likely they're gonna go to high performance levels. There's no doubt about that. Is it true that a kid can just play hockey all their life? and do nothing else and be a good hockey player, sure. But we know for sure that most kids who have a diverse experience do better. So don't hoard your kids. And you know what that means? Actually coming up to the kid and saying, hey, what other sports do you like? And by the way, who are the coaches of those kids? And what are they telling you? Because kids get a lot of inputs from various coaches. And if they have three or four coaches in their life, each coach may be messaging them different things. And as a hockey coach, take the upper hand of this, talk to the kid and say, what are your coaches telling you about psychological preparation, about physical preparation? Because we, they're going to be conflicted. Their parents are going to be telling them one thing, their teammates another, the coaches other things. So why not be a coach who has a conversation and get rid of this multi-sport problem, which is really a multi-coach problem, and actually cover it? Because this is really important to get rid of that conflict in a child, because they they want to belong to something. And if you're the coach that actually makes them belong by actually discussing it authentically, that's going to increase the likelihood to stay in your sport. And that's really important. And that's authentic. The last thing I'll mention to you is a concept we have in physical literacy called durability by design. And this means that as coaches, we're really focused on performance characteristics and not necessarily movement capacities that are needed on the ice. We keep statistics on scoring and things like that and goals against, but there's a lot of skills on the field of play that you need that are not just those skills. So durability by design as a coach means that I want every athlete to be able to last for a long time in training, in sport, in life. And that means that you're preparing kids holistically, mentally, socially, and physically. And that's critical and that it's also really important because it means it's positive. I want you to be durable, just like your genes. That's good. Parents like that. I'm a coach who creates durable athletes. Why would I not want that? And that means as a coach, as you go through your journey, you need to learn about all those things, motor control, biomechanics, nutrition, sleep recovery, and, and weight them equally. Even if you don't learn, learn them perfectly, it's important not just to focus on one, to realize that they're all critical in making a durable athlete mentally, physically, and socially. So I think I've covered everything I needed to cover today. That's a lot of checklist material. And do go through those slides and evaluate your coaching sessions, your practices, your drills, using those concepts and saying, oh yeah, I'm creating too much time pressure here. How am I gonna release it? I found that if you put three or four coaches together, especially in the COVID era, where we can have time to talk, put four or five coaches together and take each drill of your coaching session and put them through the ringer that I just created for you. Take that checklist and go, how can I take the drills that I've been using in the past and improve them to get better outcomes? And this is only a partial list, but it's a good list. And it's really important that in this day and time, when we've got the time, 
to go through your coaching sessions and go through your drills and improve them um, incrementally. Thanks. That was awesome. Thank you, Dean. Um, we have a couple of questions, if you don't mind taking a moment. Oh, yeah. to okay. Um, so we had a couple that popped up about um, the age. Heather, I, I have just one or two real quick that will go right now. And then if you okay. want to do the Q&A. Oh, yeah, sure. You want. Okay. Is that good? Yeah. So uh, on, on YouTube, one of the things uh, somebody was asking, uh, Coach John, uh, what do you think about gymnastics as a form of off ice and wrestling? Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, everybody asked me that question. And, uh, you know, what my kids did is a very interesting thing because I, I tried to grow physically literate kids. And certainly that I, I saw gymnastics as one of those. And, and many of the martial arts um, where you have um, understanding your body control, it can be very valuable um, as well in terms of conflict resolution and things like that. There is no magical formula, but I would argue that spatial awareness as a young kid from ages four till 11, gymnastics has amazing foundations uh, for children at that age, as well as many of the competitive sports. But are they mandatory? No. Are they good ideas? For sure. And then uh, Mark, Coach Mark wanted to know, uh, or he kind of made a statement about drills when fatigue help with third periods, which I, I agree, but I think we got to kind of focus on what are those drills? Is it start them down at the end of the line and have them skate and just keep skating? No, right? Um, what no. kind of some so, stuff can you do? Yeah, so, so the mentality of people in the past prior to this talk, and I'll be clear on this, was to develop the endurance capacity of the athletes by just skating them to death. That, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you can do complementary things for hockey players like inline skating, uh, running during the off season, the engine's the engine. You need to develop a good cardiovascular base for this sport. There's no doubt about that. And you can do that using multiple things, running on a treadmill, you name it, not just on skates. But what's critical, what I was trying to say is that you could actually do a little bit of a pretty uh, highly engaged um, small-sided game where people become sweaty messes. And then right after that, run a little bit of a drill where they have to then have accuracy requirements, but you don't make the accuracy at full speed. And then the, the kids go, whoa, I see the effect of fatigue on my body. That's an important thing. So the two things that you need to do are, yes, develop their cardiovascular ability by doing running, cycling, skating, all that good stuff, but also teach the brain how to control the body when they're fatigued. And we almost never do that except in games. And that's the other part to it. Don't run the death out of them and make them do a high performance drill, but run them hard or whatever you're gonna do and then have them do a drill at 50%. And then they learn, they go, oh, I understand the importance of this now. So good question. All right, I got a couple here. Um, so we have one that's what age is considered normal developer and late developer. Mm -hmm. And um, this one kind of goes with it. So any strategies around how to create the best experience for late developers or less chronological age, less experienced uh, participants and yeah. is competition a major yeah. factor in desertion ice hockey? Yeah, yeah I love it. Um, as sport continues to move towards quality sport, which I'm saying Canada and United States are very good countries, uh, Sweden, others, uh, Denmark, Finland, we're all trying to create not just sport, but quality sport. And um, we get it. And that means, and it's pretty hard to get sport excellence and sports participation simultaneously, but it is the dream of every sport. So in hockey, we've got a filter system that is pretty aggressive uh, to filter out late developers. And so what that would mean is that we would need leagues of different ability levels technically. Now this is many years off, but, but it also means that you have re-entry possibilities. And right now our system is in Canada very much a, a system that once you leave, there's almost no likelihood of re-entry. And so you need level, you need competition levels that allow kind of a diverse level of um, abilities at it. And so it's not chronological age driven. And so you'd have equal ability competition sessions and that would allow late developers to stay in the game and then perhaps rise up. In volleyball, 
they have 32 levels of competitive sport and you can go up and down based on your levels and it's age independent. I'm not saying you take the volleyball approach, but we have to think about how do we keep the late players and not filter them out. In your training sessions, if you have a team and you see that the person's a late developer, um, you can easily look at them and say, okay, well, here's some things you can do. It doesn't mean that they that they don't still acquire skill, they will, but but as they grow into their bodies, et cetera, they'll, they'll emerge even faster. So identifying people um, and d providing perhaps some special attention to saying, hey, here's some other things that you could do to develop, that's a conversation you could have. And, and realize that, that some of these people don't have, once you turn them off from the sport, they're gone. Chronologically, the first question is an interesting one. Um, there used to be a statement that people have a window, a training window, and I'm not a big fan of that anymore because I work in the circus industry now, and I know that old dogs can learn new tricks. And what that means is that we have very high level competency requirements in the circus world that people learn at 20, 21, 22, not that they did 10,000 hours from age five. So there are some famous examples of that in cycling and runners and other sports, speed skaters, where people just hopped over. Um, we need to think more openly towards um, training windows of opportunity. It's really giving the opportunity to have adequate repetitions to develop contextually specific skills or the opposite way, skills in context, as Stu would say, um, for all people so that anybody can enter the sport at any age and find a place to belong in hockey. Um, so I'm, it is very important for coaches and parents not to think that a child can enter hockey at an older age. They certainly could. They might have to put a little bit more time into it, but the 10,000 hour rule certainly does not apply. And uh, anybody can learn a new skill at almost at any age. The brain is on uh, uh, at all times. Right. Um, just to go off of that, so the first question with uh, making sure that you're challenging, you know, the late developers. I think this kind of goes back to your level, your level up, your your plus one uh, concept, where you have an early developer that's, you know, just a little bit farther along. You can still use the same drill, level up or plus one the early developer, mm -hmm. and that helps, you know, keep the challenge level low. So, so yeah, so the way I view it is that when I walk into a, a coaching session myself, if I'm coaching, I walk in, I have my minus twos and my plus twos. So I have my drill A, minus one, minus two, plus one, plus two. And then I, they don't need to know that, but then I can do an assignment, not based on level of ability, they won't know that. I'll assign them into these things and then take the minus two person to plus two for them and the regular person to have plus two. So as a coach, learning to have those pluses especially in circuit set up circumstances can really be very um, helpful for late developers. Yeah. You, you talked a little bit earlier about cueing and talking during, mm -hmm. you know, the, the movement and uh, a mm -hmm. coach on, on YouTube asked uh, something about, about saying like, if they're making a move and saying, go, 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 is that cueing to, to you or how yeah. can you help that to facilitate that? Fast yeah. So speed? What, what, a, what a great statement. Um, so there's temporal cueing, you know, keep up with the pace. And uh, then there's promotional or encouragement cueing. And, you, and, and what you just said, go, go, go. I'll give you the example though. We don't call that encouragement. We call that cueing because some cues can do the wrong thing. So for instance, for me, if I'm on a treadmill trying to go to my maximum, and a research assistant beside me says, go, go, go. I literally just stop and walk off and I go, thanks for discouraging me. But I was providing encouragement. No, you're distracting me. I don't need to hear your, your voice. So you need to understand that certain types of cues you might think are encouragement, but ask the kid, do you find encouragement for me saying, go, go, go? The other thing I can do is if I have an explosive action where I'm gonna say, and go that clap that is very prominent can be a cue that you can use to include, to evoke an explosive action if you can do it well. Um, so there are some cues that you can do during movement, like step, step, move. Those are okay. 
but providing specific instructions I would avoid till the end. So, so uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I, um, about, about the queuing, uh, there's a book that just came out from a coach out in Ireland about the language of, uh, of coaching. And he's talking about Q and mm -hmm. we're going to have him on, on the webinar here in oh. the next few weeks. So I think it will be, do just you know who it is? Nick Winkleman. So, okay. um, he, I'm not going to promote the book, you know, but it's a really good, um, book and he does a really good job at talking about kind of breaking down the movement and breaking down how you can help your athletes, um, within the movement by, um, just teaching the movement in a way of whether it's, explode off the line or, right. or that. And, and that kind of goes back to where we're doing a, a lot of different things with how to coach in our coaching ed program. And this is the queuing is such a big thing because I know I was yeah, one of is. those coaches where I was like, do this, do this. And like talking while I'm, while I'm coaching, which is, you know, gonna. But, but you're right. Load. Coaching is, is queuing science. And we need to have much more queuing science done as scientists as well. Overload is one thing. Giving too many cues after they've done something, bad practice. Finding the one uh, important cue. In the old school, we do um, explain, demonstrate, observe, correct. That's very old school. So if, if people are watching me do coaching sessions, almost everybody's writing down my cueing because they listen to me for my cues and they write that down. But I don't do, I don't follow that rule of explain, demonstrate, observe, correct. I create a contextually appropriate drill where they can learn on their own and have enough repetitions where they'll develop the movement competency that I need without me saying a word. And then I'm standing like that. And then you say, what use am I? Well, I designed that drill. So, and then I give very minor cues and maybe very different for each individual as they go through and have a momentary rest. So I think you're right, uh, Dave, cueing science is good coaching and and i think we need as a group to get better and better at that and so just to like drive that point home a little bit more um coaching from the bench so you're telling me that if as a coach i'm yelling things to my players on the ice while they're in the middle of their shift that i'm just distracting them is that what you're saying absolutely well, and I would say, and you cannot, I cannot guarantee that because there are some people that can respond to, to that sort of thing. But I would argue that in over 80, 90% of the cases, that would be actually um, deleterious to the outcome. Um, so I would say, no, don't do that. There are specific cases where that can work. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example in baseball, you know, st steal the base, <laughs> you know, watch for my cues on the bench. Um, but yelling, yelling at the players uh, generally is uh, not a good idea, especially yeah. at the young, young, young ages. If it's part of the entertainment component, if you're seeing it as entertainment for the crowd, okay. But I'm going to say you're not interested in youth development if you're doing that. And I've yelled at, at, as well, so I, I get emotional as well. Yeah. But emotional regulation is a critical thing, and, and certainly it's not going to help them learn in that competitive context. And... and uh you know, hammer about that point a little bit more, you know, they're out on the ice. There could be a lot loud things going on. You know, you have your bench in front of you, you can coach to your bench. So, you know, instead 100%. of saying yelling out, you could be coaching and say, Hey, remember to um, pass it quick, pass it quick. And just giving those mm -hmm. reminders, you're cueing them before they get out there. And that's what you're doing as, as a coach and you're doing Absolutely. a role, or you can just sit there and yeah. just hang out. So, so little things to put into their mind, we call like incidental cues as they go over the boards or, or over the board. You, you, there are things that you can do, like, you know, especially in young players, you can say, you know, focus on this now. That's called a process outcome. And a process outcome is better than the overall outcome. Both are good. But process, process cues are, hey, think about this this time. Or, you know, make sure you try to find a way to get that a blue red pass happening or whatever, those little cues over the board. And very importantly, I think we talked about this before the seminar, at the end of a game, a reflection period is really critical where, 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 where the kids' opinions of their own performances can be valued and they feel comfortable in talking about, you know, here are three things I did good. 
here are two things that I could have done better. And this is what I think I'm going to do, coach, as opposed to the coach doing the wagging finger at them. And, and I think learning how to do good reflection, it sounds hokey often to people, and I get it. But to me, an authentic reflection, you don't have to force everybody, but having an authentic reflection can be useful for learning. Agreed. I think that's all the questions I have. Do you have any more, Dave? No, I just want to be cognizant of your time, Dr. Krelars. You know, we've been, <laughs> no we, problem. We, can, we can talk for three hours on queuing and all this good stuff. So, um, but thank you very, very much. We've been asking lately some of the question, one question before everybody goes, if you could have a time machine and go back in time for Dr. De, uh, Dean Krelars back when you started coaching, what would you tell him? Well, I, I know because um, have children do it for the right reason. Um, um, there's nothing like a kid who's passionate about something and al being allowed to become specialized in that field. I have no difficulty with specialization. I have great difficulty with over-specialization. And so the kid should be in it for the right reason. And um, they can be uncertain, that's for sure. But um, and then finding specialty with diversity. And so I love many sports, but I, I had a couple of favorites. And then I, but then I, my parents never let me not do other things. So going back in time, I would say, don't hoard your athletes as a coach and let them do other things. Um, it, let them play soccer. If it's competitive to hockey, I get it. Let them, like there are competitive gymnastics coaches saying you can't do any other sport like snowboarding because it might hurt yourself. Well, to me, this is very inappropriate behavior and should not be tolerated. So diversity with specialization, be passionate. That's really, really great. And we really appreciate your time. I mean, um, just the, the, the two webinars and hopefully you can come back and share more of your knowledge because Super. I really enjoyed it. I mean, pages worth of notes. Thank so you. Um, <laughs> Thank he you. He Heather, do you have anything you want to close with before I close it down? No, no. Just thank you very much for, for coming out. We love having you. So uh, tomorrow we, ha we have uh, Steve Thompson, who's our ADM manager. Uh, he's doing a Q&A. So make sure you tune in. You could ask some goalie questions, get some goalie knowledge. And then on Friday, we have Coach Seth Appert, who's had a varied experience with many different backgrounds, but he's currently our U.S. national team uh, development coach out in Ann Arbor. Uh, he's going to talk about practice philosophy. So that's going to be a great one. So again, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Heather. We really appreciate it. And we'll see everybody tomorrow at 3.30.